Welcome to Global Ethics Review. I'm Alex Woodson from Carney Council, the world's catalyst for ethical action. In this podcast series, we'll be connecting Carney Council's work and current events with our senior fellows, senior staff, and friends of our organization. You'll hear from leading experts on artificial intelligence and technology, migration, climate change governance, and U.S. foreign policy and global engagement. This week, I'm speaking with Dr. Jonathan Crystal. He is a research fellow in the Levermore Global Scholars Program at Adelphi University and a senior fellow at the Center for Civic Engagement at Bard College. Crystal is also the author of The United States and the Taliban, Before and After 9-11. This podcast is the latest in a series of talks between Crystal and me on U.S.-Taliban relations and the Afghanistan war. In this discussion, we focus on the withdrawal of U.S. troops from Afghanistan, which was announced by President Biden last month. We spoke about what the end of the war will mean for Americans at home, and we also talked about human rights issues, including women's rights in Afghanistan's after withdrawal and the status of Afghans who have helped American and NATO troops over the last 20 years. For the rest of our podcast on Afghanistan and the Taliban, you can go to CarnegieCouncil.org. And for much more on the subject, I highly recommend Crystal's book, The United States and the Taliban, Before and After 9-11. But for now, here's my talk with Dr. Jonathan Crystal. Dr. Jonathan Crystal, thank you so much for joining us. Great to see you again. Nice to see you. Thank you for having me. Of course. So we're going to talk today about uh, Afghanistan, about uh, the U.S. troop withdrawal. Um, Joe Biden announced last month uh, that all U.S. troops will be out by September of this year, 20 years after the 9-11 attacks. So just to start very generally, what are your impressions of this plan? This is something that you've been thinking about for a long time. So what did you? what were your impressions when Biden made this announcement? So I was very glad to hear Biden's announcement. Um, And I think that it is probably the right decision. Um, It's worth mentioning that his plan, as you say, is to withdraw by September 11th, the 20 year anniversary of the attacks. Um, A lot of people focus on that date, but we've already started the withdrawal. And just after that announcement, a senior State Department official said, or heavily implied, if didn't say quite explicitly, that we would be out well before then. And so I think we should read that date as a sort of news grabber in the moment of the announcement, but I expect that we'll be out before then. Now, I think that it's a good thing, but the reason why I think it's a good thing and why I would have opposed the same action under the previous administration is because my hope is that when we withdraw or really prior to a full withdrawal, we take the people who helped us with us if they want to leave. And that is fairly straightforward. It's something that there has been recent press about. It's something that there is, I believe, the political will to do, uh, though I don't think we're moving as fast as we could be. But what I actually think we need to go further, I think we need to mount a coordinated effort with our allies and other partners to resettle Afghan citizens who are worried about what will happen when we leave. Now, I don't think the criteria should just be they're worried about it, but there are people who made life decisions based on our presence and commitment to the country whose lives will be in direct danger by the Taliban when we leave. And I think that we have a a moral and ethical obligation to help those people. I don't think that that obligation extends to staying in Afghanistan indefinitely because we certainly have made things better for some people, but have we stabilized the country? Have we gotten the country to a point where it can act on its own? Have we solved the problem of violence Uh, uh, directed against women, directed against minority groups? No, obviously not. We've seen that in the last 24 hours. And I don't think our continued presence will help in that regard either. But we can offer those people our protection elsewhere. And I don't think um, huge numbers will necessarily take us up on it. I'm not saying it like an airlift to the United States, but again, working with partners to resettle those people who want to be resettled elsewhere. Um, There was no chance that the Trump administration 
was going to do anything like that. First of all, it, it didn't value working with partners in the first place. Second of all, the idea that we were going to welcome even Afghans who helped us is a bit far-fetched based on what we know of the Trump administration's approach to foreign Muslim people. But I am hopeful that the Biden administration will take steps in that direction. Am I certain of it? I'm not certain of it. So I uh, think it was the right decision. Um, but my, you know, if you ask me a year from now, if it was the right decision, I, I guess I, I, I'm not certain I will say the same thing. I hope that I will say the same thing. So I, I do wanna speak about that, basically visas for Afghans who work, worked alongside US troops and, and, and other people who helped uh, NATO forces. Just one, one more question about the actual withdrawal. Um, you mentioned that you're, you're happy that the Biden administration is doing this. You, you think that they'll do a much better job of, of helping out the Afghans who've, who've helped out US troops than, than the Trump administration did. Um, what what are the are, are there differences beyond that that you see be, be beyond Trump's plan to pull out and Biden's Trump wanted to pull out on, on May first as you said we're already starting this this pull out um, what are what are the differences that you see in, in how Biden is handling this versus Trump is how handling this uh, putting aside the, uh, the the visa issue well I think that the major difference is not necessarily unique even to the situation in Afghanistan. I think what you had under the Trump administration was a desire to get out and almost regardless of what was going on. And that as long as the Taliban weren't actively killing Americans in the moment that we would leave. And I think the Biden administration's, the difference in their plans is that the Biden administration seems to have plans Right, that they they have at least thought these things through. Whether they reach conclusions that I would remains to be seen, but they at least appear to be doing this in a more organized fashion. Um, and if we look at, you know, there are there are very few comparable case studies. I mean, there's no there's nothing really directly comparable. But if we look at the Trump administration's withdrawal in Syria or partial withdrawal in Syria, and we see what happened there, where the, you know, the US sort of gets the order to go, they go, and the Russian flag gets mounted over US outposts, and these things are at, you know, it's sort of haphazard and, um, and has negative consequences. Uh, I don't think that some there are some negative consequences that are unavoidable but we can at least plan a sort of orderly withdrawal that doesn't um, leave everyone in the lurch, at least more than, more than we would, um, more than they're going to be. So since Biden has announced the plan for withdrawal, um, from what I've seen, there's been uh, an increase in violence in Afghanistan. It seems that the Taliban forces and Afghan security forces are fighting a little more. There's a terrible bombing a couple of days ago at an all-girls school in Afghanistan. Um, is this in response to the withdrawal plans? Was this something that, was this violence that was gonna take place in any case? And do you see it continuing at this level until September and maybe even beyond? Well, I, you know, I, I think it's important that we not fall into the trap of thinking that everything is always about us. So as bad as the recent attacks have been, there have been two major ones in the last couple of days, and you've had a consistent um, series of attacks on journalists as well. Um, and so I don't necessarily think these um, would or wouldn't happen if we were sticking around. I suspect they would. I suspect these are not tied to our withdrawal. Um, it's not as if this was a bastion of peace you know, up until the announcement that we were leaving. Uh, and it's also worth mentioning that at least as of the time we are recording this, um, the Taliban have not claimed responsibility for either of those attacks. Um, it is possible that it is um, an Islamic State affiliate 
or another group. It's also possible it's the Taliban. Um, the Taliban have been relatively careful, even despite their rhetoric about us staying past May 1st, they've been relatively careful about now not mounting attacks, at least against Americans, and not mounting attacks that might interfere with the US sort of politics around it that will make it harder for us to go. Because they see that we're on the way out. They may not necessarily trust that we're actually gonna leave entirely, although I think that we are. Um, not politically withdrawal, but at least withdraw the military presence on the ground. Um, and I think that they have every incentive to not disrupt that. Uh, now, there are other actors that might actually prefer us bogged down there um, that also have you know, their own complicated relationships with the Taliban. So it is possible. I think we have to at least consider that there are an increase in attacks before we leave with the hope of getting us to stay. But I don't think that that is, uh, I don't think that's likely to be the reason. Now, I do think that once we withdraw, we will see an increase in violence and we will see an increase in this kind of violence, which is why I think it's so important that, you know, we mitigate that both by getting some of some people out who are obvious targets, specific people and groups, if that is what they what they want. Um, and that we do what the Biden administration has suggested. And this goes to your earlier question, right? The Biden administration has been fairly clear that even when our on the ground military presence leaves, that we're not going to abandon Afghanistan, that we will still be providing, we may or may not provide air support. I think that remains to be seen, but we will certainly provide intelligence support. We will be in the neighborhood, um, you know, at least compared to the Upper West Side of Manhattan, um, you know, will be in the neighborhood and uh, not too far. So we can intervene in a targeted way and maybe help prevent uh, some attacks, at least if we get wind of them and can, can uh, um, take action from the air. So as long as we do that, um, I think we will certainly not solve any major problems, but we might be able to do some good in um, preventing some attacks from taking place. But you know, the reality is we have lost. Uh, we're not framing it that way. I understand the politics of that. And I, I understand why President Biden says that we've achieved all our goals there. I disagree with that. I actually think that the war, we achieved none of our goals. We achieved some of them, but just not because of the war in Afghanistan. Um, and certainly we could have achieved them without it. And, you know, I think we have to accept the reality that to one degree or another, the Taliban will be significantly more powerful when we go. They will be a part, at least a major part of the Afghan government and possibly be the Afghan government if they defeat the Afghan uh, uh, national army uh, on the battlefield and if they successfully take Kabul. And I think there are some good arguments as to why that might not happen but I think we are fooling ourselves if we think that the Taliban are not going to be the dominant force in Afghan politics indefinitely. What that means and how that looks in terms of the, the government itself, I, I, I think probably remains to be seen. And how violent things are before then also remains to be seen, but you know, we will have left after 20 years with the Taliban back in power or imminently in power and more members of Al Qaeda worldwide than there were on September 10th, 2001. So 
we have done a very good job of degrading Al Qaeda's capabilities. Because, you know, to be honest, I don't really care how many people are in Al Qaeda if they don't actually have the capability to attack us. You know, they can dream about it all they want. So we've degraded their capabilities. We've eliminated a lot of their high ranking people, which is both a blow to morale, but also institutional memory and planning and things like that. But did we do that because we were in Afghanistan? Well, maybe uh, in, in terms of small numbers of special forces, intelligence, drone strikes, things like that. But did that require the actual invasion and 20 year presence there? I don't think it did. And of course, we all know that bin Laden was not ultimate, bin Laden escaped it from Afghanistan. And we were able to get him any, you know, anyway. But I'm not, I, I, I suspect we could have gotten him in the same amount of time had we not invaded. Um, so I don't see us really as achieving any of the goals that the Bush administration set. But we did actually make lives better for a lot of people. And that is important. It isn't necessarily a core national interest of the United States, but abandoning those people, I would argue is, is also not in our interest. Um, and, and it's cost effective and fairly easy to, to, to solve in that regard. So I, I do want to speak about how this is affecting Afghans, and you've always been very good at making sure that's that's the focus of these talks and and, and of your work. But before that, I, I want to bring in um, something. Uh, I, I just want to speak about uh, America a little bit, bit more. Um, you know, we have a podcast called The Doorstep, two of our senior fellows, Nick Ozev and Tatiana Sarif, and, and the project of that is to examine how these issues, like the Afghanistan war, like you know, Iran, Russia, anything like that affects your, your everyday Americans. So it seems very likely that the Taliban will have a greater influence in Afghanistan after September 2021. Um, maybe Al-Qaeda will, will have uh, more power in Afghanistan as well. Maybe, maybe they'll be able to recruit more, have, have more of a, a home base there. What, what does that mean for Americans at home? Should we be concerned about uh, terrorism? Should we be concerned about things like that? Or is this is this really uh, something more for, for the Afghans to worry about? So what are the doorstep considerations for Americans when, when it comes to this? I think that, it, look, it we should be worried about, a re, uh, about any territory in which a terrorist group with global ambitions, like Al-Qaeda, uh, is able to have a safe haven and mount attacks. We are right to be concerned about that. But one thing that I think is important to note, and this goes back to the, um, to the 1990s and, and the time period before September 11th, you know, the Taliban don't care about us. They don't care one way or the other. And that cuts both ways, right? The presence of Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan in the 90s was controversial among the Taliban. Um, there was a lot of resentment towards the Afghan Arabs. And it, were it not for the support of Mullah Omar, the Taliban leader at the time, we may have had a very different outcome because there were uh, Taliban leaders who were willing to turn over bin Laden, but couldn't oppose Mullah Omar. It's not that Mullah Omar wanted Al Qaeda to attack the United States. It's just that they didn't care. And I think that that's what we're likely to see again. And I don't think that, I don't think the Taliban are gonna invite Al Qaeda and other groups to come in and set up shop to mount attacks against the US. In fact, they probably have an incentive not to. There's an incentive from the international community, but there's an internal incentive because why would you want a competing power base at the time when you are sort of about to achieve a, a, a pretty significant victory? And particularly one that you're already sort of resentful of or, or that is problematic for many ways. So, but on the other hand, 
you know, are they going to expend their own like blood and treasure to fight to fight Al Qaeda and keep them out? I don't I don't think so either. So we, we should be concerned about it, but we should not assume that we're powerless to stop that either. We can offer them incentives, as we did in the 90s, though ultimately that, that those efforts failed, but we can offer them incentives to not do that. You know, we can, one thing that I advocated in my book and that others have argued, um, Barnett Rubin has a United States Institute of Peace article about this from March, um, that we can offer assistance and recognition and the lifting of sanctions, not only uh, are related to a government, but on Taliban officials um, and their ability to interact with the outside world. And that's something that they have wanted for now 25 years or more. And I do think, I, I'm a, I think a bit more pessimistic than, than Ruben, but I do think that we have, we, we will maintain political and economic leverage even after we leave that could incentivize them to not, uh, uh, you know, to not tolerate um, terrorist groups operating in their territory. I know we like to talk about the Taliban as well as a terrorist group, but I really, I, I think of the Taliban as an insurgency. Um, in the 90s, I think as a rebel army. Um, I think they are, you can make a, a better case today for them being terrorists than you could in the 90s. But I would say they are fighting an insurgency and they often engage in terrorist acts, but they're not a traditional terrorist group. And they certainly don't have global ambitions. They could care, they could care less about us. Um, they'd like a caliphate at home, <laughs> not, not the global caliphate that Al Qaeda or ISIS um, have as a long-term long plan. So moving on to discuss uh, the Afghans um, and how they're going to be affected by this. So uh, as you brought up right at the start of this podcast, as you've been tweeting about, you mentioned in other podcasts, the idea that that um, America needs to help out Afghans who helped out U.S. troops, NATO troops over the last 20 years, uh, providing visas for them, uh, make, making sure that they're safe. It just seems like an obvious point. And it seems like something that uh, President Biden would would, would, would be all for. Um, so what, what exactly is the holdup there? And are you optimistic that this will be resolved uh, at some point soon? It's a very good question. Let me, let me just, um, let me just add something to my uh, previous answer as well, because I'm not sure if I directly touched on the impact on, on people here at home, uh, other than fear of terrorism. I think that you also have to weigh that concern against the continuing cost of remaining and whether remaining in Afghanistan um, will make us more safe. And I actually think, I agree with some people like Max Boot and others that actually the cost at this point the economic cost and even the military cost probably was, was, is sustainable, but it's not politically sustainable. And it is different than our long-term presence in Europe or Korea or Japan, where we are there because we are wanted um, and where we serve as a tripwire and we are not involved in combat on a day-to-day -day basis. The situation in Afghanistan is very different. And the idea that politically we could remain there indefinitely without real hope of ever achieving a victory, but not quite a loss either, I think is politically untenable. And I think Biden was right to seize the moment to withdraw in a way that Trump claimed to want to do, but didn't. Um, I mean, he announced the withdrawal, but it was announced, you know, it was set for after his term was up. Um, and, and, and Obama did too. I mean, everyone has wanted to get out, but no one has actually done it. I think Biden sensed that there was an opportunity to do it and, and took that opportunity. Um, so on your question about 
the Biden administration and visas and so that. So I, there had been a slowdown in processing these visas for people who worked with us. I am very optimistic that that is being taken care of and will speed up. Um, I don't think there is any resistance to that. There's, there's pressure from veterans, pressure from active service members, and it is not particularly a controversial idea. Yeah, if you're the previous administration, you don't want Muslims in the country, then you have that as a reason, but that's a minority of Americans. Um, so it is really a function of sort of just getting it done. And I am hopeful we will do that. And I, I'd be a bit surprised if we don't. What I'm concerned about, but mildly hopeful, although I'm getting a little bit less hopeful each day, is that we again, go a step further and say, female college professors, female doctors, students, uh, journalists, people who might, you know, the Taliban are not gonna roll into Kabul and just start executing people randomly. They're not dumb. Like, and, and that's terrible domestic politics. But they will probably make an example out of different groups, different people, different institutions, so that everyone, you know, and, and try to force compliance with their um, interpretation of Islamic law, we'll try to force that compliance through probably some major acts of violence at the beginning. But because they're not going to randomly attack people, we can kind of have a sense of like, who should we give the opportunity to get out? And that's something that I don't think we have any sort of legal obligation to do. We don't even necessarily you know, if, if we don't take interpreters with us who want to come, people who've assisted us, that's going to harm our ability to conduct military operations with local help anywhere, because people will see that. I don't think there'll be a, the same effect if we don't offer assistance to other people. But I do think that, you know, if we want to be able to sleep at night, um, and if we want to live up to a, 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 an informal but sort of ethical obligation, we have to at least provide that opportunity. We don't have to bring everyone to the United States, although I think if it came to it, we should. But, you know, it's a NATO operation. So I think that we can offer different alternatives. And many of those people won't leave. People don't like to leave their home, their homes. People are willing to fight for their homes. People are willing to give their lives for it. But I, so I, but I think we have to at least offer that as an option. And I, I'm not, I am hopeful about it, but that's where the Biden administration could run into domestic political problems if the sort of right-wing ecosphere, you know, media ecosystem latches onto it. And then you'll hear the talk about extreme vetting and the people aren't vetted and this and this and this. And there'll be all sorts of reasons not to. And it will be a question of whether the Biden administration wants to use its political capital on a, a, a relatively unprecedented, I don't want to use the word airlift because that is a little bit over dramatic, but a relatively unprecedented um, decision uh, or, or opportunity, or I'm not even sure how you would phrase it. Uh, and, and that's where I'm not sure. And I will admit that rightly or wrongly, it was the way they handled the question of refugees makes me more concerned. And yes, in the end, they were responsive to pressure, but I'm not sure that this issue that I'm talking about has salience with the American public in, in the same way, e even, even with the, the left, who were really putting the pressure on rightly, in my view, on, on refugees. Um, I, I'm not sure if the, the sort of positive pressure will be there. So, I, I, you know, I'm cautiously optimistic about it, but it could really be a political fight and it could be a political fight the administration hopes to avoid. Um, but I, I think we'll, we will learn that very quickly. I, I should also say the other cause for pessimism is I think this would take, this will be a tremendous undertaking to do what I suggest, 
which is to coordinate with allies and not just allies, other partners, even you know Pacific Island states who took people from Guantanamo. I mean, anyone and everyone to coordinate a sort of orderly, almost, it's not exactly a rescue operation, it's sort of preemptive rescue. Um, that's gonna take a lot of effort and energy. And I suspect we would know if that was happening. I think that that would leak um, or be or, or just be discussed. And so I'm a little bit nervous that we haven't heard talk about that. But there, you know, it's uh, we have a new administration. Maybe they are doing that and it hasn't broken through the, the news because of COVID and, and, and other things. Um, but but we will see. So one thing you said uh, a few minutes ago in the answer to another question was, and this is something that you've, you've mentioned before talking to me is that uh the lives of some afghans have been made better over the last 20 years there, there has been an improvement in the lives of afghans um uh in, in some ways over, over the last 20 years um since the u.s presence so uh i imagine a lot of those people that you mentioned are, are women and girls um whose whose lives have become maybe marginally better in the last couple of decades so what happens after September 11, 2021, with, with women and girls, uh, we saw, you know, as we said, the Taliban hasn't claimed responsibility, but there was just a terrible bombing a couple days ago in all girls school. Um, is there any reason to be optimistic uh, about that? Or, yeah, because I, I, I know, we, as we talked about before, it didn't seem like this issue, women's rights, uh, gender equality, had much of a place in, in the negotiations that have been taking place for the past couple of years. So, that's, that's right. And I, I think that maybe that's reflective of the previous administration, although I don't think that that would be reflective of Zalmay Khalilzad's position um, in and of itself. But look, it is going to get worse when we, when we leave, because the Taliban, at best, are going to be in a power sharing situation with the Afghan government. And they are going to have influence over legislation and enforcement and religious, uh, enforced religiosity, let's say. And that's the best case. So the best case I would say is a, it would be a nonviolent regression of women's rights. The worst case is significantly worse, but, um, but it might not be as bad as, it's all relative. It might not be as bad as the most pessimistic outcomes. You know, in the 90s, during the talks with the Taliban, one thing that they said repeatedly was sort of this, well, yes, we're being extra repressive because we're consolidating power, working through, but they never ruled out the idea of having female doctors who would treat women, having maybe modest levels of education in single sex environments. Like there were, there was the possibility of a system more like Saudi Arabia pre MBS than how we imagine the Taliban. Now that's terrible for women. That would be a the very strong regression, at least in Kabul, you know, rural villages different, but at least in Kabul, it would be a regression, but it wouldn't, but it, it doesn't mean wholesale slaughter of people. And it doesn't it, it necessarily, and it doesn't even mean it has to be as bad as it was in the nineties, but there, there's no, there, there, it is hard for me to imagine that there, it wouldn't regress and it wouldn't, it wouldn't be bad. How could we, I, I think, the idea of holding out economic assistance, diplomatic recognition, lifting of sanctions in exchange for some guarantees of rights, I think that there is promise in that. I think that's a good idea. But I don't think we'll be able to go as far as we might like. It would be hard to make the case that they have to go further than other states that we recognize and have normal relationships with. Like, I, I, I don't see how Afghanistan ends up better. 
than Saudi Arabia at the moment, which is a bit better for women than it was uh, prior to MBS. And I don't say that as a fan of MBS, which I'm sure people who've listened to us talk before comes out at every opportunity. But but the situation in Saudi Arabia has improved a bit for women. And I, I, I don't think it would get any worse in Afghanistan than let's say 2005 era Saudi Arabia. Terrible, but that's my optimistic take. Which is why I think, right, that what they will do is make examples and quite possibly level um, institutions that are dedicated to women's issues and education. But I don't necessarily think they will level those institutions with everyone inside. And I think in Afghanistan, that counts as some, an optimistic take. Yeah, it's, it's uh, still just a very grim scenario that you're, you're sketching out. Um, and I would add, I also wouldn't be surprised if part of the um, intra-Afghan negotiations or if the result, assuming that it is a negotiated settlement and not a military settlement, and I think that's a big assumption, doesn't have a sort of bifurcated system, which the Taliban always had informally, where the sort of rules are different in Kabul than out of Kabul. The Taliban, even when they controlled 90% of Afghanistan, enforced restrictions on women much, you know, there was less enforcement in Kabul than there was out, outside Kabul. Um, because Afghanistan, like the United States, is much more conservative in rural areas than urban areas. The Taliban, one of you know, an infinite number of problems was that things were always changing. One, another possible outcome is you actually formalize that. So people have a sense of what they're allowed to do and not do. That also could reduce some violence outside of Kabul if it allows for people to move to Kabul, if they want a higher degree of freedom. And that there's a sort of island of bounded liberty in, uh, uh, in, a, in an unfree country. Okay, well, we'll definitely be watching this in the fall. Um, last question, I know that you, you know, you're not just focused on Afghanistan and in, in that region. Uh, your interests are pretty, pretty vast when it comes to international affairs. So what do you think other nations are thinking? And you, you can just pick a couple of nations. You can talk about allies, however you want to take this question. What do you think other nations are thinking when they're looking at how the Biden administration is handling the Afghanistan withdrawal right now? Well, I think we can. Um, it's a very good question. And I think we can look at what they're looking at both in Afghanistan and outside. So I think one thing that especially our allies will be interested to see is whether we actually follow through on what the Biden administration said. Now, yes, the Taliban are suspicious about it. Our adversaries and our enemies are suspicious about it. But I think it's more important um, now that we have said we are doing this, um, everyone will be seeing whether the Biden administration does what it says it's going to do. Uh, particularly in a situation like this where the, the, the everyone anticipates we're not gonna do what we say we're gonna do. So I think in terms of that sort of amorphous concept of American credibility, um, we'll be damaged if we don't follow through. On the other hand, as I keep saying, right, that I think our moral credibility is damaged by getting out in the wrong way. But, so I think that that's important in one way, but I think that once we leave, the other thing that's going to happen is there will be, uh, uh, once we leave and the sort of American presence is sort of politically toxic internally, we'll see a bit of a scramble for concessions on, on natural resources, right? We, one thing that is different is that the natural resources from the past is that now the natural resources found in Afghanistan are valuable. And I'm not talking about opium, but you know, the, the, the minerals and stuff that I have, and I'm not a geologist, but my understanding is that these are things that are used in high tech. And so 25, even 35, 40 years ago, it was not valuable. 
they don't make as much money as they could from this because there are sanctions on the Taliban, but also the ongoing violence. So I think once we leave Russia, China, probably even UAE and other actors will um, move to try to at least get a, a economic opportunity for themselves domestically. And so I think that there are states that are watching very closely um, in that regard. Um, and I think it will represent to, again, assuming that we continue on the path that we're on, what I hope everyone sees in this, every state actor, is a, at the very least, a thoughtful, reasoned approach to policy that is not a knee-jerk reaction to, oh, it's been 20 years, we should get out, or we should stay forever because that's, because why would we leave? I think that the way the administration has gone through this, even having Bill Burns in his testimony talk about how he thinks that we will be less safe, but the fact that we do it anyway and listen to these different arguments that the president thinks about them, weighs options and follows through will, will be sort of part of the broader Biden administration that, that we're back. It's ironic, right? Because we're leaving. But, like, but, but in a broader sense, I think the message it sends is that we are now engaged actively in foreign policy across a wide range of fronts in a thoughtful way with a really outstanding team of people who are not sort of like D-listers and dead-enders focused on it. I caveat that. So Zalmay Khalilzad, um, who is the US representative or, or coordinator for the, the talks in Doha, um, who had been the ambassador uh, under the Bush administration and who is of Afghan descent, is extremely knowledgeable about this and has been um, you know, the, the most engaged and probably nuanced on this issue um, since th these talks in Doha began under the Trump administration. Um, he's not a D-list or a dead-ender. But I think that we're probably fooling ourselves if we think that Trump and Zalmay Khalilzad were like having in-depth discussions about policy. And we've talked about in this podcast before. I found it, it was both good that he was involved, but I have referred to those talks as being almost for show because I thought the Trump administration was gonna do what it was gonna do anyway. And no matter what agreement they reached, the Taliban would just roll into Kabul anyway. I'm not sure it's quite, that's quite the case now, but we, we do have, so we had capable people working on this. But you know, capable people working on something and $5 will get you a foot long at Subway. Like you need buy-in at the White House and National Security Council and, and attention and thoughtfulness to really have any sort of reasonable chance of, a, a, of a, the least bad outcome possible resulting. And, and I think that showing that we are back in that sense of a reasonable approach and a thoughtful approach, I think is important for the US image in the world globally. And it's a bit popular among um, some columnists and, and crowd to talk about the US withdrawal as damaging US credibility, but I, I, and I, it's an amorphous concept. I think it's also an important concept, but I'm not quite sure how spending 20 years in Afghanistan shows a lack of resolve or credibility. Like that's, that's, that's pretty high resolve to, to be involved for that long. And you know, it is also damaging credibility to uh, be, you know, Charlie Brown trying to kick Peppermint Patty's football. Um, and the longer we stay while treading water or regressing because the Taliban have taken more and more and more territory over the years, that also damages us. Like that damages a perception of our capability. 
yeah, it might show our willingness, but who cares about willingness if you're not capable? So I think staying there is, is it also potentially damages the reputation of the United States and the world in a different way than, and I think leaving enhances that credibility, which is why I, I also try to differentiate my view on this as someone who's been outspoken that we should leave, although doing so in a particular way, you know, that is not my general view about international affairs, right? It's specific to this context. Some people think the US should withdraw from everywhere, the advocates of restraint. Restraint, I think, is a good thing, but as a sort of formal concept, which has a lot of um, weight attached to it, and we should withdraw from here, we should withdraw our troops from everywhere. Why are we still in Korea? Why are we still in Europe? That's not me at all. Um, I am not reflexively opposed to US involvement. But I do think that after 20 years, without the prospect of achieving any more than we've achieved, it is time to leave. Um, and I just, I hope that we do. I'm quite sure we will. But I hope that we do so in an honorable way that doesn't lead to to people dying because they trusted us and, and they counted on us to be there. And before we end, I, I also think it's worth mentioning that this attack um, on the school was an attack on women and women's education. It's also an attack on Hazaras as a, a, an ethnicity and, and Shias as, um, a religious minority in the country. And, and those are other groups that we have to consider. The Hazaras who have worked closely with the United States um, in the past, who were oppressed by the Taliban in the 90s. Um, you know, they, they are also at risk. It could actually be that they get a better deal from the Taliban than from ISIS or Al Qaeda, particularly ISIS. But, but things have improved for many groups and we shouldn't abandon them, but we can leave without abandoning them. Hey, Jonathan Crystal, thank you so much. Um, always great to talk about these issues and, and to keep the focus on the people who are truly affected by, by this war. So thanks, thanks for coming on today. Thanks for having me, always happy to be here. That was Dr. Jonathan Crystal, author of The United States and the Taliban Before and After 9-11. For more, go to carnegiecouncil.org. Thanks for listening and stay safe and healthy.